and we will take also um, questions from the audience. Okay. Now, just one question, Carlotta. Will you introduce the speakers as moderator? Uh, I can do that, yeah. Okay, fine. No, no. Just to make sure there's no double. And I have a very short introduction. Okay. okay. So I think around 10 seconds and we will go live and then you see the little red. Here we go. Welcome everybody to this uh, already 11th Green Post Corner Talks organized by the Green European Foundation in cooperation with think tank Oikos. And uh, yeah, we already covered many topics in the 10 sessions before. And I think it's very timely that for the last session, we chose the future of tourism. I guess many of you watching this uh, seminar had to change their holiday plans and probably are thinking uh, spend your time more in a local area, which maybe is not such a bad thing. Anyway, it's clear that tourism after Corona will be something different than before. I'm also very happy uh, that with the team from the Green European Foundation, we were happy to organize this series and it's really a team organizing this. And therefore, I found it also appropriate that uh, this session before summer, because you can be sure we will come back after summer, that this session will be moderated by Carlotta Weber. So Carlotta, I'm very happy to give you the floor. Thanks very much, Dirk. Um, yes, I'm Carlotta Weber um, from the Green European Foundation. I'm, I'm the strategy manager there and I've been working, um, as Dirk said, in, in a team to, to organize um, this series. Um, as Dirk already said, um, there is a question whether um, tourism might change. Um, but now we are already seeing um, European borders opening again. Um, the European Commission has launched a reopen EU initiative. And the question really arises whether, whether COVID-19 can be a second chance for sustainable tourism that considers and tries to reverse the, the detrimental so social and environmental impacts of tourism. Um, was this freeze of, of international tourism and travel, um, yeah, was this the chance to, to really bring this industry to, to low um, or even zero carbon intensity? Um, or are we already going back on the, on the wrong track, so to speak, um, returning to over tourism, um, as was the case before pandemic? Um, and will maybe previous efforts um, even be reversed? So I'm really happy to, to welcome two great speakers. Um, we have uh, with us uh, Rob Fletcher, who is an um, environmental um, anthropologist and associate professor, professor in the sociology of development and change group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And he's an author and researcher working around issues such as ecotourism, globalization, has worked on tourism and, and degrowth. Um, and we also have Bram van Brakeveld, the alderman of the city of Ghent responsible for tourism and a member of, of Grün, of the, the Flemish uh, Green Party. So I would like to give the, the floor first to Rob. Um, for many years, you have been researching issues related to tourism and you have published various articles as well as, among other things, a co-edited a book entitled Tourism and Degrowth that I, that I also just mentioned. Um, you are analyzing problems such as over tourism, but also the cultural impact um, of more specifically even eco uh, tourism. Can you maybe tell us a bit more about the impact tourism pre COVID-19 already had on, on our societies and environment and cultures? Um, and since this was a still rapidly growing industry, how does this connect to the, to the concept of degrowth? How can this be connected and, and what could be a framework for truly sustainable tourism post COVID if you, if you could create it uh, from scratch. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much uh, for this introduction and also for the opportunity uh, to be part of this discussion uh, and to share my views. Um, in thinking about uh, these questions of sustainable tourism, uh, my basic perspective uh, is that making the in, uh, tourism industry as a whole more sustainable entails not just trying to change how tourism is done at the current volume that we had it before the crisis, but also emphasizing the need to reduce its total volume uh, as a whole in order to achieve any chance of genuine sustainability, right? And this is something that doesn't usually come up uh, in discussions of uh, sustainable tourism, which tend to focus much more on merely trying to reduce the uh, environmental and sometimes uh, even social impacts 
of tourism uh, as it's currently practiced. Right, but I think it's uh, quite clear that the global volume of tourism that we experienced before the COVID crisis uh, was simply unsustainable uh, in any dimension, and it would have been impossible uh, to render it uh, sustainable in either environmental or social terms. Right? And this is not only because the environmental impacts of this volume were impossible to mitigate enough to make a real difference, but also because, um, as we just heard, it was already starting to have very profound social impacts, even if the environmental impacts uh, were mitigated. Uh, so it would still not be uh, sustainable uh, in social terms. And what I'm referring to here is, of course, uh, this growing discussion of over-tourism uh, that was very prominent uh, in Europe before the crisis, where a range of very popular European cities um, were experiencing uh, what many residents considered to be unsustainable flows that were impacting their ability to actually enjoy the cities in which they lived. Uh, the dis discussion had been growing uh, within Europe ever since the 2008 economic crisis, as tourism was very much used as one of the strategies to try to re-stimulate economic growth uh, more generally. Uh, and some places had already started to react to these discussions by putting in measures in place, not just to make uh, the tourism flows that they had more sustainable, but to actually try to reduce uh, this tourism growth, uh, at least uh, to a specific degree. And then all of a sudden the uh, COVID crisis hit and everything changed in an instant. Uh, before this crisis, uh, people had started to respond over tourism by saying, well, what about under tourism in particular places? But that had been a very minor part of the discussion. And all of a sudden the entire world uh, experienced what you could uh, consider uh, under tourism. So many of the um, social uh, and environmental issues uh, that tourism um, activists have been calling for uh, for some time before the crisis were realized in an instant, right? Carbon emissions dropped off significantly. Pollution in many places also dropped off. Waterways became clear uh, in Venice. Um, bird life started to return to the canals, many other places as well. Uh, and previously overcrowded city centers all of a sudden became deserted and they became slowly repopulated uh, but primarily predominantly by uh, local residents uh, as international travelers um, continued uh, to be banned. Now, of course, the big problem with this was the economic impact of this sudden loss of tourism revenue, right? Uh, tourism is one of the largest industries in the world. Uh, the UN WTO uh, claims that it comprises a full 10% of global uh, GDP. And so this uh, sudden loss of tourism exposed a, another uh, um, grave problem with the tourism industry as it was previously practiced uh, in terms of uh, its resilience, um, uh, given the fact that it could potentially be so volatile and that all of a sudden, uh, very quickly, a substantial portion of the global economy could essentially just disappear, right? Uh, and so this became another um, aspect of this crisis um, of uh, tourism development. We're seeing problems in uh, environmental, social, uh, and economic terms uh, simultaneously, right? And so quite predictably, uh, we've seen the main response from many uh, industry organizations, including the UND, uh, UNWTO uh, and the European Union, has been to try to reopen tourism as much and as quickly as possible while still trying to take uh, the threat of, uh, of COVID spread uh, still at least uh, somewhat uh, seriously. Now, it's very unlikely that this will really recapture all of the lost revenue um, that uh, uh, pundits predicted at the beginning of the crisis. Um, so the economic implications of the slowdown will still need, need to be addressed um, more significantly than we've seen at present. But even if tourism flows start to return to something that they were approaching uh, the levels before the crisis, the same environmental and social problems we experienced uh, will simply uh, come back again. Now, of course, organizations that are promoting uh, tourism regrowth always qualify that this regrowth needs to be more sustainable. Uh, but as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, if this regrowth uh, is intended to recover volumes uh, similar to what we had before, uh, then I just don't think it's possible for these to be rendered uh, sustainable. Uh, so I think the, uh, the, um, the blunt conclusion of all of this um, is that uh, the current situation uh, uh, shows a need uh, to limit tourism regrowth uh, to make sure it stays uh, far below the levels it was in the past uh, as more and more places uh, reopen to domestic uh, and international tourists uh, over time. Uh, and while in the past, governments frequently responded to complaints about over-tourism by claiming that they could not control the numbers of tourists who arrived in a given place, the way states around the world have dealt with the COVID crisis has shown that this is untrue. Uh, so direct regulation of tourism flows, even after the crisis, remains possible. Uh, and to my mind, this is essential um, for the industry to have any chances of sustainability. Um, among other organizations, the NGO Stay Grounded, uh, based in um, Europe, uh, published in uh, uh, December uh, 2019, a really interesting report outlining various ways that this could be done uh, with respect to, to air travel uh, specifically. Um, and so limiting this tourism regrowth will automatically address, to some degree at least, uh, issues of environmental and social uh, sustainability uh, that we experienced before the crisis. But of course, there's still a need to make uh, 
um, resurgent tourism flows are more sustainable in var these various ways as well. But the issue I really want to point to here, uh, and I think is most essential for us to address uh, in this discussion, will be the economic fallout of all of this, right? Because um, reducing uh, the growth of the industry in the future will inevit inevitably mean much less revenue for the industry and for national economies generally, as well as for many people uh, who gain their livelihoods from tourism work. And so I think this is where the majority of our thinking and planning really needs to concentrate right now. Uh, how can we work to make sure that the reduced uh, stream of future tourism flows, if we are in fact able to limit it uh, in the ways that I've discussed, uh, is more equally distributed among those who work uh, in the tourism industry? Uh, and also to ensure that those who are unable to continue to work uh, in a downsized industry are su supported in finding other uh, sustainable livelihood opportunities. Uh, I have some uh, thoughts about how to address these issues. Uh, if there's time later to introduce and discuss them, uh, but I'll end my opening remarks uh, with these essential questions uh, and leave this for now. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Rob. Um, I think that that was a really great overview um, and a very very uh, quick introduction, um, staying staying at the time limit uh, to the to the issues at hand. And indeed, I mean, I, let's let's come back to it um, after we hear from Bram um, what can be can be done very practical on on a local on a city level, um, because you were mentioning, I mean, the, the economic fallout, and we have indeed um, national economies around the world where you know up to one third of, of the national GDP is depending on on tourism. So um, indeed, um, I and I think our our viewers would be really curious to hear your ideas on that. But um, let me give the floor to Bram first. Um, for his first intervention, and uh, you wanted to share a PowerPoint, so I hope everything works out. I, I give the floor to you, Bram. All right, thanks a lot. I hope that uh, everyone can see the, the PowerPoint uh, as uh, I, I can see it, but I see you nodding. So thank, thanks a lot, uh, Carlo, for giving the floor. So my name is uh, Bram van Rakenveld. Uh, as, as told, I'm an alderman of, uh, of tourism, but also re responsible for, for labor market work, social economy, uh, public cleanliness uh, staff and of course uh, like, like mentioned also tourism um, I have been contacted to elaborate on the question uh, how to balance the economical aspects with environmental social impact on GANS plans to restart tourism in a local and sustainable manner uh, I have not been told how to do it in 10 minutes but nonetheless I will I will try to do it in 10 minutes uh, for those of you uh, who do not know Ghent and I hope that now my slides will go on Yes, there they are. Um, we are just uh, 30 minutes away from Brussels Central uh, by train. Uh, Ghent was next to the biggest city, uh, next to Paris, the biggest city uh, on the north of the Alps in the 15th century. Uh, and now we have around uh, a quarter of a, a million inhabitants. And um, we are the biggest uh, student city in Belgium. Uh, and with North Seaport, we have one of the largest international uh, ports in the world uh, a few years ago. Lonely Planet uh, rated Ghent as Europe's best kept secret, and I'll uh, I'll show you why. We have a medieval castle in the heart of the city. We have the famous uh, alt Ghent altarpiece uh, by uh, by Van Eyck. Um, we have three beginnings, uh, uh, which uh, are listed also on the UNESCO World Heritage List. We have modern architecture, although the Gentians call this uh, the sheep stable. We have uh, an award-winning light plan. Um, but most importantly, most importantly, um, we have a lot to show, but our main asset uh, is our vibe, our Gentians itself. So maybe a bit about our tourism. Um, the more appealing our city became the last years uh, for its inhabitants, the more, of course, uh, tourists find, uh, found their way to our city. On 20 years time, um, it doubled. So. Uh, that means that we're not on the level of Amsterdam or Barcelona or Venice or something like that. So it's not to be compared. But nonetheless, um, when I saw these uh, these graphs, uh, when I started as Alderman in, in 2019, in January 2019, those kind of graphs, um, they uh, they shook me up a bit. I knew that uh, something had to happen uh, if we would not um, became uh, the second Amsterdam or Venice or, or, uh, or Barcelona. Um, on, on uh, in, in kind of uh, over tourism, as mentioned before, so um, we knew we had to we had to act, and uh, we decided not to do this on our own. We decided to start an open debate, an open consultation with uh, the stakeholders 
um, because when you see the predictions um, before Corona, of course, you can see that uh, one of the estimated figures was that we would double again, uh, but this time in five years time from uh, 1.1 million um, uh, overnight uh, stays uh, to 2 million in five years of time. So that would be really uh, tremendous uh, and would really have big impact on our city. And so to avoid that and to, to look to, 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 to find a solution to the question, uh, how, how can be, uh, tourism be sustainable for our city? We started a debate, a debate with, uh, with our stakeholders. And uh, we, we asked uh, a controversial, uh, a bit of a bold uh, question, are tourists going to have the monopoly about, uh, of Ghent? Um, so we started uh, with, uh, with a couple of nights of, or evenings with uh, our inhabitants, but also our stakeholders to discuss about that topic. Uh, and we started uh, in November 2019. And our final report was on the 12th of March, uh, the day before Belgium went into lockdown. So um, maybe just about uh, what about the results of uh, of that participation pro, uh, process. Um, there were uh, a couple of uh, very clear conclusions um, that uh, we can we can um, we can uh, can see that was a red line uh, as a, as a as a result. Uh, the first one should, that was that uh, tourism should be absolutely sustainable. Um, it's very clear that, uh, and I will give some examples later on, but it should be very sustainable. The second one is that uh, it should be only in Ghent. That means that it should be based on our DNA, on our city, on uh, who the Gentians are, uh, and it should also be balanced with uh, the size of our city. Um, the, the third um, conclusion was that it should be accessible to all. Um, so that means that all Gentians uh, should want to share their city uh, but they do not want to sell it to tourism. That's an important um, fact. And uh, the last one is to keep all stakeholders involved. And that means that not only uh, the people who work in the, in the sector, but also those uh, who live in Ghent. Uh, all of those people want to be involved, and that's a good, that's a good thing, that we can create our tourism story uh, together. So um, let's zoom in on evolution about sustainable tourism. Maybe a couple of facts. Um, from, from the beginning on, we started to, um, to focus on slow traveling. Uh, we focused on the fact that uh, tourism isn't sustainable when you come here and, and you, you make a selfie and you're gone. No, uh, we started a, a specific campaign about, you know, if you're here in Ghent, welcome and stay more than one night, uh, as you can see on the picture. Um, but we also um, were changing policy about Airbnb. Uh, so we, we, we we forced to stop uh, because we know that it wasn't sustainable for the people living in Ghent, uh, for the prices of our homes and stuff like that. But we also stopped investing in the local uh, airport company in Ostend uh, because we, you know, it wasn't sustainable anymore. So that are a couple of facts uh, that we that we started to change. But um, later on, during the the debate and uh, as a conclusion of the several debates we had. We, uh, we made up a plan, a plan, a plan um, to uh, to make a few, a couple of actions um, to make uh, our tourism uh, policy more sustainable. So we focused on air quality, we focused on housing, uh, uh, we focused on our position uh, as a sustainable city. So that means that we, we decided to you know uh, to keep the touring cars out of the city centre to half the amount of the river, river cruises. Uh, to focus on collective transport uh, to come to Ghent, to electrify guide tour boats, um, stuff like that. But also, if you uh, look into the hotel sector, we, 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 we wanted to invest into the Green Key. Um, uh, we wanted to have a fair BNB, uh, not just an Airbnb. Um, so um, that were very uh, important points. But then, of course, uh, something happened. Corona. Uh, so the 16th, the 16th of March, uh, Ghent was like a ghost city. Uh, and of course, that had a huge impact. Uh, a loss of turnover, of course, um, but also, um, yeah, a lot of failures to be expected. Um, we mentioned uh, resilience, uh, Rob mentioned it. Uh, and, uh, and on one hand, I'm very happy that we were never um, this far dependent on tourism uh, in our city. But nonetheless, we have 7,000 people working uh, for uh, or, or, or 
where we have, where the job is related to tourism. So that's something important to keep in mind. And we see now already that 700 uh, people are unemployed temporarily, uh, although that hotels in, in, in Belgium never had to be closed. But of course, if it's not tourism, you don't have hotels or, some, uh, or, or uh, something in a, in a business that, that is working like it should be or like it was. So um, that's that's one economical aspect. But of course, we, we saw also that um, there was a huge impact on the on the on the liveliness of the city. Um, Kentians uh, realized that th there's also a very important positive impact on tourism on the vitality of our city. Um, a city needs to needs tourism as a museum needs uh, art or as a bar needs beer. Um, I always mention that, but uh, in, when it when it when, when it was going good, uh, as we say, but uh, in this period, uh, it's also uh, important to mention it because uh, tourism is important for a city, uh, but if it, only if it's on, on a healthy uh, level. So um, then, the, of course, the question arises: how, how, how are we going to uh, cope with this coronavirus? How are we going to uh, to make sure that uh, we can have tourism on a on a on a good way? So um, we we discussed once again with all our stakeholders, um, and we knew that we had conclusions of our debate that we uh, that we had uh, had together not so long not, not so long ago, and um, we draw some very important you know, conclusions. Like uh, we we knew that this would be a very difficult period, but we also decided not to go back, not to make the same um, mistakes as we did before. So. This is a this is a moment uh, to to jump into a future proof and sustainable tourism story, balanced with the city and its citizens. Um, so um, for us, Corona uh, was a fast forward into the outcome of the citizens' debate, and that's of course uh, a, a, a very big uh, privilege, um, and we should really use this momentum. So we decided to invest 1.5 million euro um, to um, to have three. Uh, important objectives. Uh, first of all, we decided to uh, invest, of course, in marketing, but then um, to, to show Ghent as it really is. Uh, I think that that's very important. Uh, and the second um, is that we uh, invest in Corona-proof product design. And that meant uh, not only uh, all the gels and, 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 the, and the coverage that uh, people are using, but also to focus on, on spreading of tourism uh, around the city um to discover hidden treasures uh, but also to invest in sustainable ways to get there and by bike on foot uh but also uh to support local entrepreneurs um who are of course uh in cash troubles uh but uh, use to use that investment also to invest in sustainable goals i think that's very important and of course as an economical and academic academical city um congresses and meetings are important uh, it's also uh, important for our tourism story but we know that we are going into a next phase on in, in, in congresses and in meetings uh, so we are investing in that to have a, a debate uh, also together with the university to see how can we uh, write a, a sustainable story about uh, congresses and how can we be uh, um, how can we uh, cope with the, the new future of congresses so that that there are three main objectives about uh, our corona approach for tourism but uh, like i said it also um, made possible to accelerate it, a few of our um, planned actions like electrification of guided tour boats like uh, bike rental uh, to invest in the green key um, but also to focus on employment in the tourism sector uh, as mentioned it's very and for me also as as uh, element on, on work it's an important challenge um, that we can invest in future proof, future proof, proof jobs. Um, so, and one um, especially important thing is that um, we um, felt that it's important to invest once again in local tourism. Uh, so what we, we worked together with our Flemish government uh, to have a campaign about, uh, we missed you, uh, welcome back. Um, and that was a good leverage to, to focus really on local traveling. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a positive thing, it's a positive thing that, we're, that we reinvented local traveling uh, thanks to Corona. Uh, and that we didn't just do it by the city of Ghent, but together with, the, with several uh, partners. 
Um, so I think I'm running out of time. I will try to conclude. Um, if you are asking me what are now the conclusions about uh, the future proof story about Corona and, and the impact on tourism, I think it's still too early. We don't know if there will be a second wave or uh, other uh, kinds of impact, but it's important to look forward. That's, that's one, uh, that's one uh, conclusion. Uh, the second is that, uh, of course, we are just one little city in an international market of tourism uh, with a big uh, lobby system behind it. So we, as a city government, we are taking a responsibility to invest in a sustainable story and a sustainable policy. But nonetheless, uh, we do not have everything in our own hands, not every tool is in our own hands, but um, we dare to, to make choices. Um, and one of the things is that we, we invested, and that's the, the third conclusion, um, in, a, in, an, um, in not keep on growing, but uh, to invest in a sustainable way and uh, and to keep the balance with the city. I think that's very, really important. Um, and uh, to do that, we, we work together with our stakeholders. So, um, and I'm happy to conclude that Corona in this story is an accelerator for a future proof, proof and sustainable tourism in Ghent uh, instead of a threshold. So that's, um, that's really an important thing. Uh, I think that uh, that was what I wanted to tell in those first uh, 10 uh, minutes, but nonetheless, um, of course, if you would ever doubt, you're all welcome again. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I um, indeed I think that uh, in, in this uh, case, this is a, a story with a with a partially good ending. Or as you said, I mean we're not at the end of, of the story yet, but uh, indeed it shows um, how important it is that you also have um, a diversified um, economy and, and Ghent was in that case not so dependent um, on, on tourism um, and the, the effects have uh, therefore not been that devastating yet. Um, I wanted to ask for a short clarification. You mentioned twice Green Key um, uh, in, in also in relation to housing. Maybe you can just quickly say um, what that means uh, specifically. Well, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a label, and of course you can, uh, I think for me, uh, the, a label is important, but it's not, it's not, it's not the end. Eh? Uh, the Green Key label is especially for uh, uh, the places where people can come to stay. Um, so, um, and uh, a couple of, uh, of hotels already have the label. Uh, it's a kind of investment in, in more sustainability. Uh, I think it's a good thing that people can, uh, and hotels can make um, steps forward, but I do not think that this will be the end of the story. Um, but uh, if it can help uh, for the sector on the whole to to put a huge step forward um, into sustainability, that would be important. But as I mentioned, it will it will not be uh, the last step in a sustainable uh, story for tourism as a whole. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, there has also been a, a clarification question from uh, via Facebook to to Rob. You were you were talking about uh, possible ways to to basically really. Um, become active from from the government side uh, to to avoid um, over tourism again and someone on Facebook wanted to know um, basically do you mean that um, we should have tourist caps so limiting the, the entry to countries or certain regions um, to, to avoid that they're becoming overcrowded or how how you see those actions um, becoming reality mm -hmm. Uh, it's a very good question uh, and an essential question. Uh, and my short answer uh, is yes. I think that's exactly what we need, um, but not necessarily in terms of uh, direct uh, caps on number of tourists. We need to do is, uh, is to really think about what the uh, the carrying capacity of cities can be um, in, in social uh, and environmental dimensions, and then to use other forms of regulation to try to reach those uh, those, those carrying capacities rather than direct uh, tourist traps uh, taps. So, um, limiting the number of uh, airplanes that are actually able to land, uh, limiting the number of um, uh, runways that they're able to use, the number of other forms of mass uh, transportation that are able to access the city, the number of hotel beds, but of course, then also regulating other, um, you know, less formal uh, forms of accommodation like Airbnb and other uh, uh, social media uh, based platforms. All of these things are, I think, uh, essential steps and are going to have to happen uh, as we new, move forward. But I do want to point out that one of the, the potential pitfalls of this that we really need to take seriously is the fact that if you just think about limiting numbers of tourism flows, then just based on uh, basic principles of supply and demand, uh, costs are going to increase. And essentially what you're doing is then 
suggesting that uh, that only the people who can afford to are those who are going to be able to travel. And this is actually what um, some destinations do uh, quite consciously as a way to address issues of over tourism is to focus on what is often called a uh, quality tourism, right? Uh, smaller numbers of tourists who pay a lot more. And that, of course, creates a, um, a, a social justice issue, a class issue that also needs to be thought through. So somehow we need to limit the number of tourists who arrive in a place while also distributing uh, the availability uh, to travel um, across the social spectrum, uh, potentially by differentiated uh, airline rates, a differentiated tourism tax, which is another uh, form of uh, regulating how many people arrive uh, in such a way that um, that it still allows uh, a wider spectrum of of humanity to have access uh, to travel in the future. Thanks. Yeah, maybe then we're uh, we're. I see we're already diving into um, uh, tackling the, the economic questions. I think here. Um, uh, we also had a comment from uh, from Facebook questioning if it is always so useful to to focus on uh, the GDP um, benefits um, and not looking at the the local benefits indeed uh, because a lot of the um, well value of of tourism doesn't even uh, land in the local com communities. Bram was also um, mentioning um, this uh, yeah issue of uh, one one day stay tourism um, with with guests not even staying uh, this is a big problem also in in cities like Venice um, but uh, yeah we do have um, countries um, especially in the global south smaller island countries like the Maldives where um, yeah the the GDP um, or the economy uh, depends um, to one third on on, on tourism um, in a lot of countries, uh, the foreign currency is also used to uh, sustain actually the local com communities and the wildlife around it. Um, so, Rob, maybe you can you can highlight a bit of the economic ideas that that you were mentioning in the beginning on how how we could avoid this this economic mm -hmm. default. Thanks. Uh, first, yeah, addressing this issue of GDP, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, GDP is a very crude uh, measure uh, of economic activity uh, and economic uh, prosperity. Uh, and it's been very uh, profoundly questioned uh, in lots of ways for, for a long period of time. Uh, if you're looking for a more in-depth uh, analysis, uh, the book uh, Donut Economics, uh, very popular recently by Kate uh, Raworth, does a very good kind of analysis of the problems of GDP. You know, um, that only measures uh, some aspects of flows, but it is really useful as a shorthand to emphasize how important tourism is uh, in the global economy, but also uh, uh, in, in a variety of national uh, and local economies. But of course, um, a lot of other um, activity, economic turnover, as you say, um, a lot of impacts on housing, transport, pollution, waste, and all of that. And as you mentioned, uh, one of the big uh, problems of tourism uh, is the issue that, that we call leakage, the fact that a lot of um, resources that come in uh, leave the local area uh, quite quickly, right? So one of the first things to do is, is to make sure uh, that more of the resources um, you know, are captured within uh, a given place, but also distributed, right, uh, within this place um, so that um, you know, more people uh, involved in the industry uh, have more uh, access to this. Um, how do you do this? Well, it seems that our, uh, our colleague from Ghent uh, has, a, has a lot of really uh, good examples and measures that have been put into place to try to do uh, exactly this. So I would like to turn over the floor uh, to him uh, to discuss uh, that uh, more practical aspect of addressing this on a, on a concrete level. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think that um, at the moment when uh, tourism became, becomes an, an, an only an economical story, then you're in deep trouble. Um, mm. So that means that um, it's very important to be uh, resilient as a, as a city um, and towards uh, tourism as a whole. Um, I think that um, it's very important to be, of course, open uh, and open for, for tourism, but also to, to, to see the benefits culturally. Um, when you have every day a group of people coming to your city and looking at your city from their point of view, that's very, very interesting. Um, to learn more about your own city and to learn more about how 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 how, how this, the, the world is working uh, you don't have to travel just to know how how, how the world is, uh, is working as a whole you can also talk to the people who are visiting a city every day and of course i know it's a bit it's a bit naive but you, you should never forget that that's that's the real importance about tourism that visiting is a very important and, and big thing, but it should make you dependent on it. Um, and uh, I think that when when you lock, when you lose that balance, um, it's very difficult to uh, 
and especially in times like these, um, to find a new uh, story uh, and to, to, to see that uh, your labor market is sustainable enough to be resilient enough. Um, so that is why we had to make, that is why we are proud that we made choices before it was too late, uh, that we learned uh, from Amsterdam, from Barcelona, from Venice. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that, that this is an, an, um, an exercise that every uh, European city has to do. Uh, and of course, it should be uh, sustained by uh, uh, also the, the, not only by the city itself, but I think that it's a European story. Um, and uh, that is why it's very important that uh, our political leaders are awake for that and they do not, you know, just uh, think that things should be like uh, before. No, this is really a momentum uh, and we should take it uh, if we want to have a, a sustainable tourism story. Because like, as I mentioned, it's really important, but it's, it's, it can be dangerous when it's only an, economic, economic, an economical story where you are dependent on it. So um, I think that that should be a really, really important focus for the next, uh, the next few days, weeks, months, uh, to take this momentum and to change that policy. Uh, can I add uh, briefly uh, to this discussion a bit more? Yes, please. So this issue about the impacts of tourism uh, that extend beyond um, the tourism economy itself, uh, issues of housing, public space, transport, pollution, waste, all of these things. Um, within a, a tourism uh, research, right, we refer to these as, as kind of the tourism comments, right? The fact that there's these background elements of a place, of a city, whatever, uh, that tourists don't pay for, but are, are really essential uh, to their experience, right? And often that becomes the burden of the public administration to provide for these things that end up being translated into revenue that oftentimes is, is captured by uh, uh, private sector firms, um, you know, tourism based, right? Uh, a really uh, interesting article in The Guardian recently called The End of Tourism uh, that really made this point that, um, uh, that the tourism industry is somewhat unique because it tends not to actually own the things that it sells as the basis of its revenue. And so one of the things that you need to do is to try to make sure that tourists and that tourism providers are actually paying uh, to a certain extent uh, for, the, for, the, for the things that they use. Uh, and essentially you have to do that through, through some, some form of, uh, of tourist taxation. And I was wondering in Ghent, uh, in order to encourage people to stay more than one night, uh, do you have uh, some form of tourism tax? I, I know in Venice, they instituted a tax uh, that was trying to encourage people to stay um, longer by um, you know, having a tax uh, for people who only stayed uh, in the city for uh, for a very short time. So we just have a, a flat tax, uh, but we, we chose not to uh, how to say um, to uh, raise the tax. So it's three euros per, per night. Um, we, in the past, we 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 tried to um, to uh, to make a difference between the kind of um, of a stay, but. Uh, Apparently, it wasn't uh, legally <laughs> to do that. Oh, so, okay. it, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's a flat tax. But nonetheless, um, we uh, try to stimulate by, uh, for example, a city card and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's important. But we also we also decided not to raise the tax because I think that um, when people are willing to stay uh, the night, a mm -hmm. couple of nights, that's uh, more sustainable than, for example, um, the cruises uh, yeah. who decide to, you know, uh to to hop by and uh, you have uh, those great groups of people wandering around the city and on the whole it's mostly that kind of groups that people um uh, don't like in the city so and when they see those kinds of groups not spending anything uh, um and then leaving again with their uh, very uh, filthy cruises um that's 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 a kind of tourism um that we decided not to invest in uh, even more. We, we decided that it should be less than before uh, because that's not really an example of uh, sustainable tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a really good example of one of the tourism uh, subsectors uh, that depends uh, so much on infrastructure that it doesn't pay for. And we've really seen the dramatic impact of that in terms of when uh, entire um, cruise ships uh, became infected with, uh, with COVID. I needed then to rely on uh, the health of infrastructure of places in which they weren't based uh, and you know where they didn't pay taxes uh, and that created a huge amount of problems. So I think one of the major changes that's like we're likely to see in the tourism industry moving forward uh, is in terms of the cruise industry. I think that's going to be uh, restructured uh, uh, and re-regulated uh, tremendously or at least at least I hope so. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really a, an, an important um, issue uh, connected to, um, since we're talking about the, the biggest polluter um, besides air travel. Um, I wanted to connect this to a question on train travel, uh, which uh, might see maybe a revival. Uh, there are some regional agreements creating um, uh, travel bubbles like uh, by, by Latvia, Lithuania and, and Estonia. Um, mm -hmm. And also the, the um, trying to promote domestic tourism and, and as Bram also mentioned, local tourism. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was wondering what your assessments uh, were maybe, um, yeah, do you think this could um, promote more train travel? And a, a specific question also from Facebook for Bram, how do you see Ghent in a, in a hopefully new network of night trains across Europe? Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are only 30 minutes away from Brussels Central by train. So, uh, unfortunately, my my train uh, uh, towards Vienna was uh, was uh, uh, couldn't go on because of the crisis. But um, we have we have several of train stations here in Ghent, um, and uh, one of the things that we want to do is uh, to to plan our uh, arrival in the city. Uh, more um, uh, than it is today, so that people can feel welcome when they arrive here in, in our train stations. Because for the moment, that's a big that's a big problem. Um, that, so that that will ask uh, more of investments uh, later on. And fortunately, in one year and a half, you can change everything. But um, I really think that uh, train traveling uh, will be uh, yeah the 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 the, 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 um, the the way to travel in the future. Uh, and and you see a revival, and you saw a revival before. Um, uh, COVID um, of uh, night trains, uh, and I think it's very really important. So, but also uh, on that uh, level, I think that um, you know we are, we are having debates about how to support um, the airport companies, uh, Lufthansa, and so on. Um, but um, I do not hear the train lobby uh, this this uh, at this time. Uh, I do not know where they are uh, if they are uh, you know taking actions to um, address politicians to invest in that kind of traveling. Uh, and uh, that's really uh, disappointing, but maybe it's only uh, in Belgium, I don't know. Uh, but um, I really believe that if we could do um, more invest investments on uh, night trains, um, that uh, we could connect uh, Europe in a, in a very, uh, in, a, in a better way than today. Uh, just to add, as a, I fully agree with that, and I think one of the, the major things that needs to happen uh, in Europe and other places, uh, particularly, uh, for instance, uh, in North America and uh, the United States, where I'm originally from, uh, is major investment uh, in that form of uh, public transport, ground transport, especially uh, high-speed trains. Um, I think we're uh, going to start seeing uh, more restrictions on, uh, and especially just uh, discouragement uh, from short-haul uh, air travel. And in order to replace that, it's going to be essential to have uh, you know better uh, and faster trains. Um, you know, one of the um, uh, the issues around uh, uh, train travel is, of course, uh, you know, the fact that many of us are um, so pressed for time uh, in general, and when we do need to travel um, places. Uh, it's often just not possible to spend the time it takes to um, uh, to be on a, a train as as they the, as they are right now. Um, so um, I think the the movement uh, towards more um, uh, train travel will definitely require. Uh, more efficient uh, and faster trains, and, and especially uh, uh, night trains, uh, as you as you've mentioned. But we also, um, like I, I, like I mentioned, I'm also uh, the staff of Alderman, and uh, one of the decisions we made is that when our staff has to travel, um, they cannot travel uh, by by car or by 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 plane uh, uh, any longer on the way that we did before. Uh, they should take the train, um, and uh, I think that's very important. But you know, so I'm, what I'm trying to say is that yep. everyone has an um, has a, its role to play in that in that story, um, and should you know we should cooperate to make sure that uh, this would be an investment for the future. But it's not a, it's not always easy uh, because you know uh, there are several um, uh, levels of uh, government uh, competent for for that story as a whole. But nonetheless, uh, if everyone takes responsibility, it could it could, could go a bit big. Faster than today. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I definitely agree with that. And uh, my university has done something uh, similar now. I mean, our new restriction now is uh, um, if a, if a travel is less than uh, than six hours, right? Then we're not allowed to travel uh, by plane. But I think um, those changes need to be accompanied by some type of more structural change in terms of how our lives uh, are organized, right? 
right? In, in, in certain times, it's just not possible for me to um, attend the events that I want to do uh, if I have to spend uh, six hours on a train. As an example, in the week before uh, to give a talk, um, I had to leave after teaching a class on Monday and be back again uh, before teaching again on Wednesday, right? <laughs> Those are the restrictions that I had. And the only way I could possibly do that was by flying back and forth, right? So, um, yeah, it's important for us to take individual responsibility for the things we can, but we also need uh, some support, I think, in terms of uh, helping to reorganize our lives uh, so that we can uh, move uh, slower uh, and stay longer uh, in the places we visit. For sure, that's that's one of the aspects. I think, uh, well, now that we are, I mean, we're still in, in, COVID, in the COVID-19 period, I think a lot of uh, event participation will also maybe stay online um, in the future. So. Uh, I think there is uh, certainly, I, I like the idea of slowing down our lives in, in general, but I think there is also um, the aspect of traveling less in general, whether that's for, for tourism and, and for work, maybe with, with having a digital infrastructure that brings a whole lot of new problems with it, but it could be, it could be one uh, solution. I mean, you both were, were talking about um, major investments that are needed, um, talking about the responsibility of everyone uh, we have a we have a question on this. Um, what you really do on those like yeah, those are mainly in the tourism industry really big big players. And uh, Ram, you were mentioning the the lobby behind it. So um, and you also said that it's complicated because there are different levels of, of government involved. So yeah, what what really would be the changes uh, you you would like to see from from different government levels? I mean. In Belgium, maybe you know the regional and the national, and then maybe the European level. Um, but also, what are concretely um, maybe the changes um, that that consumers um, need to to take need to do in in their own behavior? Maybe a couple of things. Um, well, a lot of things, but uh, I will try to mention a couple of them. Um, I believe that. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about tourism, uh, it's very important to keep the positive things uh, top of mind. Uh, so uh, over tourism is a problem, but that doesn't mean that tourism is a problem as such. So I, I really want to stress that. But nonetheless, I believe that uh, we all have seen that, um, you know, grow, growing without, uh, without, without uh, limits, that, that's really a problem. So uh, as Rob also mentioned, um, we should have a debate on that. We should really focus on what kind of tourism do we want in the future? Um, and it works, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we made the choice in Ghent to have that debate, not just with our citizens, but also with all our stakeholders, and we put them together and, and then they realize, okay, uh, that's your perspective, of course, because you gain money by tourism. Oh, and you live here, so that's, that's important for you. So that kind of dialogue, of course, we're just a city, we're not in <laughs> not Europe, but um, that kind of dialogue is really important. Uh, because it, it, it's, it's treating the future on, on tourism and the kind of tourism that you want. Uh, and as I see in Ghent, people are really uh, eager to show their city, to work together on a touristical, touristical story um, and, and to show the city as it is. But as it is, is really important. You know, we do not, we do not want to sell a story that isn't correct. Um, we want to have the interaction. And I believe that's that's kind of tourism that on the whole of Europe, could be the future, but we just have to invest in, in having the dialogue with one another and not just to see the, the, the euros behind the story. Um, I think that that's a, a really important mind shift that uh, that will, um, you know, uh, we have to have today. And uh, also because, as Rob mentioned, uh, if we do not uh, ask, uh, act quickly, uh, a lot of people are going to lose their job. And for the moment, there's not something that will come in place of that job, you know. Um, so, um, therefore, therefore, a sustainable story on tourism is also very important. A sustainable policy is very important. Uh, but I th also believe that, um, you know, on uh, um, tourists as it's as itself, they should also realize that they ha also have an impact the way that people are traveling. I mentioned Airbnb. Of course, uh, it's very. Uh, it's very easy and it's also, uh, you know, it's my, the way I like to travel as well, you know, you come into people, their lives. So you, you, you can see the city as it really is, you think, um, but, you know, the, there's also uh, limits to that. Uh, it's not, it's not sustainable for the people who live, um, uh, who, 
you know, uh, nearby. Uh, and it also um, doesn't help uh, for, for um, to, to, to invest um, in the things that you really want to invest in uh, on a sustainable level. So that's why you also, as, a, as we as, as, as travelers, should make our decisions a bit more, um, a bit more uh, overthought. Uh, and that should be stimulated also by the government um, that uh, on the one hand to, uh, to make sure that the Airbnbs uh, of this world do not keep on, um, uh, um, you know, keep on having profits without investing. Uh, because, as Rob mentioned, that's really a problem. Uh, so those are a few of uh, of, the, of the things I, I'm thinking about. But of course, um, as, as I mentioned, it, it, the big question is: Are we are we allowing ourselves to think about a, a tourism of the, of the future? And are we are we prepared to make choices? Are we prepared to make decisions? Um, and that decisions will have an economical impact. On short term, of course, uh, thinking about crews, thinking about airplanes, but on the longer term, um, that will make a, a, a huge new story uh, for a lot of people working in tourism today and tomorrow. I think that that's very important that we have to debate on that. Yeah, just to add a bit, because this is a, a normal question. Uh, but also uh, enormous question, excuse me, but also uh, an essential one, right? Um, how it is we actually make the changes that, that we need to. Uh, and of course, as uh, Bram said before, it requires multi-level governance, right? I mean, have changes that have to happen uh, at all different levels. Um, individuals can make certain changes, municipalities can make certain changes, nations can make certain changes, but ultimately they need to be uh, supported uh, by larger larger structures as well. Um, if one uh, city, one country in Europe limits uh, uh, tourism flows, uh, then most likely, uh, you know, tourist flows will simply go uh, to another place that doesn't have that uh, those same limits, and we'll just uh, collectively. Uh, but then, you know, concretely, what do you do at these different levels? Uh, it can be quite difficult. Uh, and the example I, I come to uh, is uh, in uh, the beginning of my research, which was not focused on urban tourism or over tourism at all, uh, but on rural uh, ecotourism, as uh, Carlota mentioned, right? And uh, for a while, that was kind of the emphasis uh, in um, trying to focus on sustainable tourism was to try to redirect people away from taking advantage of uh, big tourism enterprises, mass tourism, uh, standardized packages, and to get them to focus on alternative forms of tourism uh, that were in smaller scale uh, in rural areas uh, that involved uh, less uh, uh, environmental impact, hopefully, uh, and more um, kind of a deeper uh, cultural interaction uh, with local people, right? Uh, and that can work to a certain degree. Uh, the problem is, uh, again, uh, to be able to maintain those those aspects, uh, the industry has to meet, has to uh, remain relatively small, right? So it can't grow very much, or it becomes uh, part of the same problem that it's trying uh, to correct. Yeah. Uh, another aspect of the problem is that it's quite clear that the majority of tourists aren't actually looking for that kind of experience, and they are actually interested in these types of mass tourism experiences. Uh, that you have, right? One thing that can be done to try to educate uh, tourists or to try to encourage them to think in different ways is, of course, these eco certification uh, programs like uh, Green Keys that we heard about before. That works to a certain degree, but it's also quite clear that uh, that most tourists uh, don't know uh, and that many actually don't care about the sustainability of their enterprises, right? So there's certain things that tourists can do to actually put their values into practice by seeking out sustainable alternatives, and there's lots of guidance for how to do that. There's other things that, um, you know, uh, governments and also private entity certification programs, but they also need to be accompanied by some form of direct regulation, right? That creates a, a stimulus for smaller and medium term enterprises, most likely through direct subsidies, through tax breaks, right? Through providing direct economic uh, encouragement, okay? And that somehow also discourages the growth of these large uh, enterprises by uh, taxing them more, uh, by placing more restrictions on their growth, right? So you need um, this form of direct uh, regulation, uh, I think at the municipal level, at the national level, also at the regional, and hopefully a global level as well, uh, combined with attempts to try to um, encourage, uh, you know, local um, uh, alternatives, uh, and also encourage uh, uh, tourists uh, to um, think about the impacts of their travel uh, and start um, trying to do uh, what they do uh, differently. Thanks very much. That's a, that's a huge challenge, all of that.
course. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I think also just wanted to point out um, that uh, yeah, we are we are talking about basically reducing um, while still making sure that the livelihoods of those who are working in the industries are not uh, too much affected. Um, I just wanted to point out also the the gender dimension. So the International Labour Organization has also um, warned in, in its latest uh, predictions on, on uh, the decrease of, um, of income to the tourism um, industry that uh, those majorly affects uh, young women, a lot of young women, but we also know um, that a lot of migrant workers um, are actually um, employed in the in the tourism industry. So I, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, I think in general it connects a lot to um, to a redistribution and equality discussion um, this topic as well. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on on how to also yeah um, soften soften the the impact of of this economic crisis on those groups. Um, I think uh, yeah, softening the, imp uh, the impact of the crisis uh, is one thing. Um, but also what you've pointed to here is the fact that the majority of the labor uh, in the tourism industry uh, before the crisis was also very, very problematic, right? A lot of it was uh, done uh, particularly by, um, by young women and often, um, you know, migrant women. Um, and often that employment was very insecure, very precarious uh, and very poorly paid uh, doing things like uh, cleaning hotel rooms, right? And that kind of thing. So it was already a very a big problem that activists were pointing to before the crisis, right? So in addition to trying to find ways to support people's loss of livelihood, right? The last thing we also uh, don't wanna do is go back to simply uh, trying to recreate those same uh, forms of precarious and underpaid uh, paid employment uh, that happened before. Um, how do you address all this? Well, I mean, ideally, in a larger sense, and this goes beyond tourism, what I would like to see uh, come into place uh, in, in all societies, but, but especially within Europe where we have the resources to do so, uh, is universal basic income. Um, that's been in discussion for quite some time now, and since this crisis, it's just very dramatic in terms of uh, how uh, much impetus there has been uh, to developing uh, this discussion. Uh, and I think it's uh, something that really needs to be brought uh, more and more into the central of policy discussion. Uh, Spain is starting to implement uh, a semblance of uh, UBI. Other societies are considering it. Um, Finland uh, just concluded a major uh, study of a pilot project that had really interesting results. I think we need to uh, think about how to um, continue this discussion in the future uh, so that nobody um, has to wholly rely on income from tourism and especially from uh, precarious uh, sources of income. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, interesting that you mentioned universal basic income. Our our foundation is working uh, for a long time already on this, and uh, one of our past uh, green post corona talks uh, in this format was on the topic of universal okay. basic income. So a lot of the things you mentioned were discussed there. So I encourage everyone to go back in in the recordings and and rewatch it. Uh, well, we're coming already uh, slowly to the end. I would uh, maybe uh, give give the floor uh, again to Ram to uh, maybe give some concluding words um, um, or also answer to to what Rob and, uh, and I just um, pointed towards. Yeah, I didn't expect us uh, debating on uh, on, uh, on on the topic, but nonetheless. Uh, and my young years as the president of Young Green, uh, we put it on the agenda as well. So, and that's also already six years ago. So, uh, I really believe that you know it's good that uh, when the when we have crises like this, we we we, we want to think out of the box. And um, so, uh, stuff like the basic income and 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 and, uh, and topics like that are really important. You know, just to to make sure that you, you do not keep uh, following the same path. Um, especially when you know that the same path will lead to uh, uh, not so great things. So uh, uh, I just want to, to stress that. But um, I only want to say thank you for this, this debate um, and this conversation because uh, I believe that this is one step, an important step towards another tourism, um, as, as to have the debate. You know, uh, just to ask the question: are we, Did we did it go well before? Uh, and uh, and how can we you know change our policy? Uh, after after Corona, after COVID, so that uh, we can really focus on a new kind of tourism, and I think that's really important. And that a lot of things that I wanted to say already passed uh, the review. So I just want to thank you for the organization and for having me here. Thanks very much. Yeah, indeed, I think that uh, we will continue to have this uh, discussion. So uh, we have actually a project ongoing on um, the question of. Uh, 
yeah, future proof, uh, zero carbon tourism and whether that's possible. So we're working with, with great green foundations and organization organizations in, in many countries across Europe. Um, this project was planned already before the COVID uh, crisis hit. Uh, now we are readjusting the focus uh, a bit, but uh, yeah, please please stay tuned to um, to follow the Green European Foundation. And uh, maybe we, we have this discussion again in, in a bit of a different setting then, and we see where, where Ghent went. Um, I wanted to thank you both uh, very much. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, Rob, for, for, for joining us. Um, I hope next time uh, we can also have a panel uh, with a bit more female representation again. Um, but, well, sometimes it doesn't work out um, the way we want it to. Um, I think I want to thank everyone who has tuned in, not only today for the, for the Green Post Corona Talks, but in the last, uh, well, 10 weeks already. Um, and accompanied us uh, through this through this COVID-19 period. Um, I want to thank the team that that made this this all possible. Um, if you like to support us, uh, tune in again in in autumn and consider making a donation. Uh, we will see each other back in autumn. Then again with with Dirk uh, taking over the moderation. Um, thank you very much and have a good summer. Thanks. Thank you, Carlotta.